This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at Google's latest Nexus phone. This is the Nexus 5. Latest generation, nice fast Qualcomm Snapdragon 800 CPU inside IPS Full HD display, only $349. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the Nexus 5, much anticipated, finally out, and as we expected, some pretty nice specs inside, some that are kind of mid-range, but a really enticing pr price, $349 for the 16 gig. No contract, no carrier involvement there, and $399 for the 32 gig. Now, before we talk about everything else about the Nexus, let's make a couple of things clear. There's two variants. In the U.S., there's one, and then there's one, well, basically for the rest of the world, and they have different LTE bands. The U.S. model that we have here has LTE that will work on every major U.S. carrier and some minor ones, too, but here's the caveat. This supports both CDMA and GSM. See, Sprint use CDMA networks. T-Mobile and AT&T, for example, use GSM, so... Good to go there, has LTE for all of them, but Verizon won't allow it on their network at this point. They only allow so-called approved devices to authenticate on the network. Same thing happened with the 2013 Nexus 7 tablet when the LTE model came out, and Verizon said, oh, we're going to approve it, it's going to take four or six weeks. That was a while ago, a couple of months overdue, so if you are a Verizon customer, do not buy this expecting to be able to use it today. Will, will they approve it in the future? They haven't even said that, so I don't know. Certainly, technically speaking, it's capable, but if Verizon doesn't allow it to authenticate and access their network, it's not going to do any good. Okay, the rest of you. T-Mobile, AT&T, Sprint. This will work. You'll have LTE. You'll have voice. You'll have all the goodness that you need to actually use the phone. Smaller carriers as well, though some like U.S. Cellular said they haven't actually approved the device to let it on their network either. So you're going to have to do a little legwork there and find out if you have a smaller provider. Maybe call them up and ask them, will they allow this on their network? If you have a GSM provider, even if it's a smaller provider, then generally speaking they do. They'll allow anything on there. You just put your micro SIM card in there, you're good to go. It's only with the CDMA providers that you have to go through these hoops. Okay. So now that you Verizon people have tuned out, or you're still watching because you're hoping, hoping that Verizon will come out with their own version or let you use it on there. This is a lovely phone with a 5-inch IPS display. It is made by LG. It is loosely based on the LG G2, a phone that we really like. It has a slightly larger 5.2-inch LCD display. We'll compare those in a minute, by the way. 1920 by 1080, so you got full HD right here. Not a bad looking phone in, in Google's way. It's kind of modern, minimalist. It's got that signature kind of curve here and here, top and bottom. Very symmetrical since the keys are soft keys right here on screen. They're not capacitive. It's one of those phones that when you turn it off, you might not know if it's upside down or upright. One clue would be the 1.3 megapixel camera on the front for video chat. There is a little LED indicator at the bottom. It's capable of doing multicolor notifications. By default, it only does white, but there are apps on the Google Play Store you can use to actually get multicolors going if you want. Despite the fact this is a 5-inch phone, it feels pretty good in the hand. Now, I have pretty good-sized hands, but still, as 5-inch phones go, it's nice. The curves are in the right places, and I do like these straight sides because it gives you something to really hold on to. The ones that taper to a little fine point, it's kind of hard. They can cantilever in your hand. Not a problem here. Casing is plastic for the price. What are you going to do? That's certainly acceptable. But we have cool things like ceramic covered buttons right here. Feel nice. Stick out just a little bit so they're tactile. You can feel them. That's your volume rocker right there. Up top we have our headphone jack. Microphone right there. This side we have our micro SIM door right here with the usual little hole to push in to pop it out. Smaller hole than usual. A paper clip won't work. The iPhone tool wouldn't fit. It does come with its own little popping tool, but it's kind of nice when, you know, just a paper clip will do the job too. It won't. Power button is right here. On the bottom, they're doing the iPhone trick. See, it looks like stereo speakers. We have two symmetrical grills here surrounding the micro USB port. It is not stereo speakers right here. Speaker over here, and it's okay. It's not super loud. It's not super rich and full. It's adequate at best. And here we assume there's probably the other microphone is under this grill. On the back we have the big old Nexus logo, which if you turn it around, here it goes, you can see it now as I move it back and forth. Back is not removable. Battery is sealed inside. 2300 milliamps, which is not unlike the HTC One and the Samsung Galaxy S4, though those run on slower processors, so they probably need a little less battery power. 
LED flash here, really not a very bright LED flash, an 8 megapixel camera with this big old surround around the lens. It's kind of funny, it makes you think, wow, this is an important camera, we're really focusing on it, but it's actually a pretty average camera, 8 megapixel standard pixel sensor size. It was kind of like, well, hot a year ago, wasn't it? Now we're all into 13 megapixel or better or enlarged pixel sensors, so... Google really has not been focusing on the camera much for the last several Nexus models, so don't expect huge things here from the camera. So inside the phone, we have largely really excellent specs. As I mentioned, LT that's going to work with pretty much every carrier, as long as your carrier is willing to play ball. 2.2 GHz Qualcomm Snapdragon 800 quad-core CPU. That's the new high-end CPU that's as good as Qualcomm gets these days, and it's very good. certainly competes with the Tegra 4 nicely. One is one of the fastest CPUs you can get in a phone. That has Adreno 330 graphics, 2 gigs of RAM in here, and as I said, 16 or 32 gigs of storage. We have dual band Wi Fi 802.11ac here, Bluetooth 4.0 LE. As you would expect, NFC with Google Wallet support, and that's supposed to work even if your carrier is not really into NFC payment systems yet. And of course, it has the usual GPS. What's special? For right now, anyway, it has Android OS 4.4 KitKat. Yes, they went with a commercial name here, so now we have to reference candy bar products. Hmm. That is what it is. Anyway, 4.4. In terms of UI, it's not going to be a big jump. They tried to lighten things up. They sharpened up the Roboto font that they use. And this is something that's new just, they say, for the Nexus 5. Kind of like how BlinkFeed is your leftmost screen. Google Now is your leftmost screen. I actually find that handy because I use Google now all the time and I don't have to fiddle with pressing and holding the home button or anything like that. So that's a Nexus feature. Other than that, I, probably most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You get better photo editing capabilities on the phone. Pretty much the same kind of standard settings and notifications. We have what they call Project Svelte inside. Do you remember Project Butter from a while ago? Well, this is Project Svelte, so it runs using memory more efficiently, and that means even low RAM devices could potentially run KitKat, which is nice. As ever, this is a Nexus phone, and that means you will be the first person on your block to get operating system upgrades firmware when they come out. Don't have to get carrier approval. The manufacturer doesn't have to QA at first. Once Google's ready to throw it out there, you'll get the over-the-air update, and that typically is good for about two years until Google feels the hardware is not up to running whatever demands the operating system is putting on it. The Nexus really has changed over time. You know, it used to be it was a super high-end device, the original Nexus, for example. And they did that because early on in Android's history, manufacturers didn't really want to take a chance on making a flagship Android phone, maybe taking on the iPhone in the early days of its serious dominance of the smartphone market. Well, now, obviously, flagships abound. We have the HTC One, the Samsung Galaxy S4, the Note 3, all sorts of really nice phones, the LG G2 that this is loosely based on. So Google's new effort is to make something that is affordable and carrier agnostic, which is kind of nice because everybody is getting tired of their contracts and their carriers. Just ask T-Mobile. They're certainly making a big deal of that. And Google wants to have Nexus devices and Android, basically, in the hands of as many people as possible. And the way to do that is to make it inexpensive. Like the Nexus 7 tablets, for example, they sell well, and they're actually in retail stores, so people have more awareness of them, I would say. They're trying to do the same thing with the phone. So that's what you're looking at here. You don't have a phone that's going to have all the GWIZ features of the Samsung Galaxy S4. Obviously, this is just plain vanilla Android. For those of you who like those customizations that manufacturers have, like with the Samsung Galaxy S4, you can have multitasking with two windows side by side on the screen. With, even with the Moto X, and Moto is now owned by Google, you've got neat things like active notifications. With the LG G2, you have their quick menu access and their tap, tap on the screen to wake. You're not going to get any of those fancy additions here. You're not going to get the consumer IR remote to control or your home theater gear, which is kind of all the range and all the flagships right now. You're just going to get solid basics with this phone, and that's what it really is about. Since this is an IPS display, it has wide viewing angles. It's also Gorilla Glass 3, and let's see how it looks off-angle. Obviously, we're going to pick up some glare, but it does pretty well. It's also bright enough to be seen outdoors, which is always important. That's an advantage IPS has over Super AMOLED displays that really are hard to see outdoors. This is quite clear to see. So just as the Nexus 7 tablet is one of the most inexpensive, decent quality tablets you can buy, and this is the most inexpensive, decent quality smartphone you can buy, there are still cheaper competitors. We have the very cool Black Pearl S740 that we reviewed recently. This is $250. 
uh, also a pretty understated, or what would you call it, plain design right here, but this guy doesn't have LTE and it only has a 720p IPS display. And the colors on this are not as good as they are on our Nexus 5. Now to compare it to a phone that is more expensive, here's the LG G2. This guy has a higher resolution display, slightly larger display to a whole bunch of software features on there, which average consumers might actually enjoy. You Android geeks who are probably watching this, you hardcore users you probably won't enjoy. Both of these have IPS displays. You can see that the LG actually has more contrast and deeper color saturation. So there are quality levels to IPS displays. That said, this is certainly a very nice display. It's just not nearly as color saturated say, as the Samsung Galaxy S4 and Note 3. You know, the Super AMOLED displays, they just have wicked, better than life color saturation and very rich blacks. And you won't get quite the display you will on this. But of course, the LG G2 is more expensive off contract. It's around $550. Since it's a Nexus inside, you won't see any carrier bloatware. You will see every application Google has ever invented for Android and still actually supports. So we have our Google Drive, our Google Earth, Gmail, email, Google settings to control all of those settings. We got Google Hangouts right here, Google Keep, Google Maps, of course, and navigation as well. New Photos application. And here is the Photos app, and it just gives us a small view of our picture. We can do rotation, we can do crop, and we can apply various filters to it, which sort of makes up for the fact that the camera application has like Zippo filters. Used to be if you got a Nexus phone, you would not get an Office-compatible suite. Here you do. Quick Office is on board because, well, Google bought them. So now you can actually create and edit MS Office compatible files, which is nice to have too, so you don't have to spend a little extra money on the Google Play Store to buy yourself a suite. Of course, you still can if you have your favorite, but that is what it is. In terms of speed, very fast. I mean, this obviously, this is a very, very fast CPU in here. It's the fastest you can get right now, and it, it's kind of overkill for the tasks most of us use phones for. Mostly 3D games are going to be the most demanding thing that you do, and we'll test those out in a bit, but responsive, quick, and it also helps that this is just pure Android right here, so you're not seeing a whole lot of anything that's ever going to slow the phone down. And if we go to all settings, very straightforward, no customization, pretty clear, no wondering where things are because they're in a whole bunch of tabs. All the standard features are here. You can use this as a hotspot for your tablet or your laptop, for example. You can control what access points you connect to for Wi-Fi. You can set up your data internet connection settings, so you really don't need to fiddle with that because it auto detects pretty well. Also new with KitKat, you see where it says right here, say, OK Google now. Aha, see, I was trying to say that quietly, it still heard me. That'll start a search. Now that will only start a search if you're on the home screen. Look at the poor thing, it's still trying to figure out what I'm saying. And if you have the phone turned on. So this isn't like the Moto X, which has a dedicated signal processor that's low power and always listening all the time, so you don't even have to turn the phone on. So with this guy, you have to be on in the home screen. And then you can say, OK Google. What's Google's stock price? Google closed up 0.12% today at $1,022.75. It does a very good job. I'm always pretty pleased with Google voice control, and it's starting to get a little Siri-like there, only you don't get the humorous and snarky comments there. But it's very functional. It works quite well. So does voice input. If you don't really want to type on the little on-screen keyboard, and you only get the default Android keyboard here, well, then you have another option. You can just speak things. And speaking of the keyboard, this is what it looks like in portrait mode. And you can see there's a little press and hold here, so you can actually get numbers instead if you want. And here's what it looks like in landscape mode. So pretty big, pretty roomy. Since it's a 5-inch phone, unless you have small hands, I think most people will be able to reach the middle when they're holding each side of the phone. What we have on screen right here is our SunSpider JavaScript test results, which brings us to the benchmark section of our review. 718.4 milliseconds. That's a pretty good speed, certainly for Chrome, which has always been a little slower than the old WebKit web browser, which is gone from Android now. Not as fast as the iPhone. I know you Android people are just going to say, don't say that, but it's true. Yeah, the iPhone is low 400s, this is low 700s. It's still very good and better than most Android phones on the market, which run anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000, where lower numbers are better. So we like to see the lower 718 number. For other benchmarks, for 3D Mark, we had to run the extreme test as well. It, the phone was just too fast.
as you can see on extreme it was maxed out so we had to run the ultimate test which doesn't give you the demo numbers but i can tell you that running the extreme test it did 48.9 frames per second for the demo on the unlimited test it scored well you can see right here 17,828 very fast on on tutu it scored 27,000 and 17, also an awesome number, and right up there with other Snapdragon 800 quad-core CPU Android phones on the market. Quadrant, I think Quadrant's not ready for KitKat, because it scored 8808, and it should have scored about twice as high as that. And since all our other benchmark numbers are real high and where we expect it, I would say that that's a Quadrant issue. So now for the more mid-rangey aspects of the phone, you know, for the price, like I said, you're not going to get the best of everything here. Obviously, you're not getting that consumer IR remote. I don't know how many people care about it. But we have the sealed design. That's not unusual. Even high-end phones have that 2300 milliamp battery. Compare that to the LG G2 that has a 3000 milliamp battery. Got to give up something to drop the price from the price of the LG G2 at full retail. Front camera, 1.3 megapixel. We're looking at 2 megapixel these days, or, or camera sensors with bigger pixels. So it's decent for video chat, but it's not as good as the ones with a higher resolution camera, which includes the LG G2 and the Samsung Galaxy S4, and the Samsung Galaxy Note, and even the iPhone with this enlarged pixel sensor 720p front camera. The back camera here, well, yeah. The good news is that Google could fix this with firmware updates. The bad news is they're probably only going to fix 50% of what's wrong, but it's going to be the more important 50% for a lot of you. The part that Google probably won't fix because they did this to us intentionally. And, you know, Google's camera app just gets worse and worse with every generation. I don't know. So here, let's play a little game of Where's Waldo, okay? There's no little cog to tell you where to get to settings. Obviously, we don't have menu button here really to get into anything like that. So you're like, okay, well, I got this is obviously my shutter button. I could probably tap to focus. There I go. I can do that. It's right now going red because it's telling me it can't focus on something that close and that shiny. So we'll move it over there. Here we tap on that. We can go between the, the full panorama, the VR panorama, the regular panorama between video mode and photo mode. And if you press over here, you figure, well, I got flash control and location. Obviously, there we can bring up settings. And Google loves that arc, which is really very hard to control. You can also get that by swiping up, but that is so hard to control that you're just not going to get there. And as you move this up, it's going to tear up and show you different kinds of settings, which is probably more confusing than anything else. So sticking to this, obviously, we can turn on HDR+. Plus on and off. It, it has an improved HDR mode. You also have access to your exposure EV right here. Even more settings. That's with the universal Google symbol. Oh my god, the LG is sliding away. That is called a slippery plastic phone there. Flash control right there. And here's how you switch the front and back cameras. Now if you tap on the little setting things, you're going to get to more options. Geolocation, timer, white balance. And see, these menus just keep hopping around. It's like more Where's Waldo. I think most people are going to just avoid ever going there, to tell you the truth. So that is what it is. Google likes that. It probably won't go away anytime soon, no matter how much us, us reviewers complain about it. Uh, the other challenge is that the phone has slow autofocus. Now, sometimes it can be really good. Other times, it's just like it hunts and it starts hunting some more. And granted, the LG is moving. In fact, let's switch to something else that doesn't squirrel around. So here we have something more well-behaved and stationary. And in practical use, you'll see it hunting a lot. And it's going to just start zooming in and out by itself, which, which isn't so great. And this happens whether you're shooting photos or videos. And now other times it can be really, really quick, too. Particularly if lighting is good, it's going to be fairly quick. That's something Google can fix, and I expect that they will fix with a software or firmware update to, to improve the autofocus speeds. In terms of image quality, we're going to show you on a bigger screen we're going to, with a high color gamut. We're going to use our Sony Vio Flip 13 to show you some of the photos that we took because obviously everything looks good on a teeny screen. So here we've got the Sony Vio Flip 13. Yes, we will have a review of that too. And here are some pictures that we've taken. Now this is indoors obviously. It's a big box store. Nice colors and pretty sharp. So it looks good. Even when we zoom in really big on this. And this is a full HD display with very wide color gamut. So you're seeing a pretty accurate representation of it. So that one's pretty nice. And then we have some fruit from the same market. And you can see how the yellows are blooming here. The reds are blooming, and it's causing it some focus issues, too. Uh, here, not so much in focus. Down at the bottom, a little bit better. But this looks more like, well, camera phone from two years ago. So it's a very uneven result sometimes. This was much better. Of course, the colors are not nearly as saturated here. The lighting was a little less direct. But 
there's a whole lot of detail. You can see the skins of the onions very clearly and the mesh over here. Now if you look at the garlic, there's a little overexposure of whites. It also has a tendency to blow out the highlights. But really it's not that bad. We can see color variations and tonal variations in here and still get some detail. That one I wouldn't complain about at all. Here's an outdoor picture. It has slightly Disney-esque colors. It, it certainly does like to saturate the colors, but most people like that, so I'm not going to complain about that either. Lots of detail in here. It's, you can see the evidence of sharpening, but it's not an offensive level. And lastly, trying a macro shot. Now this is capable of taking some pretty good macro shots, but here we see the problem that it has with blowing out the highlights and with some red bloom there. Uh, certainly, again, this is something that can be improved with software or firmware, and I hope that they do. They probably will. How about calling in data? First, you can see the, the dialer has been updated. It's still pretty easy to use. you got your large number pad right there, a call button. New here, you see your, your most recent call, you see your favorites down there, and you can see there's a little message right here, Caller ID by Google is enabled. So this is a, a new thing, a new way that Google is snooping into your life. If you have a Google Plus account, and Google's been doing their best to try to make you get one to use a lot of their services these days, if you have a picture associated with your Google Plus account, they're going to use it as a universal Google Caller ID. Now, you can go into your Google Plus account and turn that feature off, but by default it is going to enable it, and that's what it's letting us know right here. So how is call quality? Call quality has been good in our tests. Now, we tested this on AT&T's network in the Dallas area, and to be honest, they have excellent call quality here and really, really strong LTE coverage. And if you're so this is a best case scenario for the phone, honestly. I would love to have tested it with the Verizon SIM, but obviously we can't to see how it would do with that. But anyway, good call quality, not wildly full and rich, not quite as good as the Galaxy S4 in that respect, but clear, audible, easy to understand. Earpiece volume is average and adequate, I think, for most cases. If you're at a football game, not so much. Speakerphone down here, kind of mediocre. You'll hear it when we're playing games, which is usually when it, it's at its loudest because game audio is particularly loud. But Overall, it's a fine voice phone, and obviously it's important because it is a phone. Data speeds are going to be dependent on your carrier, obviously, and what region you're in, but it did just as well as all the flagship phones do on AT&T in terms of data speeds. On the LTE network, we averaged almost 18 megabit per second down and 12 megabit per second up, so plenty fast. And again, it does have the mobile hotspot feature, so you can turn this into a hotspot for your laptop or tablet. Of course, we have the YouTube app on here, and we're going to test out some video playback so you can hear the speaker and see how it does. We've played up to 4K video on this, and it plays just fine. And I'm sure you guys don't want to see Apple products, so let's pick Surface. Not a super loud speaker. You can see where we're at right now in volume. Let's bring it up. This Let's is go a pretty Microsoft loud. Surface 2. This is a Windows 8.1 RT tablet direct from Microsoft with some improvements inside and a new look to the casing. And pretty much the same style, but new finish. Place fine. Look Looks app. great. And we're doing that over LT on AT&T's network. And though obviously the display is nowhere near 4K resolution, this is a Sony Bravia 4K test file. You can see that it can handle playing it just fine. It does look gorgeous. I mean, you still have a whole lot of pixels squeezed into a small area, so it looks nice. So it can handle 4K playback. So we're going to test out Asphalt 8 Airborne to see how gaming does. It's one of the nicest driving games currently on the market. Really nice graphics, pretty demanding. Take our Audi on the road. It's certainly beautiful looking, isn't it? Plenty of detail there. And I'm steering like a drunk, but that's okay.
plays perfectly smoothly, beautifully. You got the sunlight effect on the screen, all sorts of stuff. Nice looking. Very smooth play. A little nitro boost. A little double nitro boost. Frame rate's still keeping up nicely. So that's Asphalt 8 on the Nexus 5. So how about battery life? 2300 milliamps is decent. It's not stellar given how big batteries are getting inside phones. Of course, phones are also getting bigger too to accommodate those batteries. Typically so far, it's lasted me through a day, going from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., and by then it's down to 15%, and I use the phone for calling. It's checking Gmail, obviously, with push Gmail. I have it set to automatically check some other IMAP accounts on the schedule as well. Using it for surfing, playing half an hour of streaming HD video on this, using it to play music while cooking, that sort of use makes it through the day. I did have some problems at first on day one where the Android media server, which is a process that runs an Android that keeps track of the files you have on your SD card and on your internal storage, kind of went haywire and the phone got warm in my purse and apparently was running like gangbusters for five hours even though the screen was off and that drained the battery real super quick, but I haven't had that problem again since. So that's the Google Nexus 5 made by LG. It's available now from the Google Play Store at $349, like I said, for the 16 gig, $399 for the 32 gig. And it's a nice mix of mid and high range specs. I think they covered a lot of the high range specs that people care about most. The camera is still a little iffy. So if you're on a budget and you want a very clean Android device that's going to get OS updates fast, obviously the Nexus 5 is a great choice. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review with benchmarks, photos, and more, and hit that subscribe button.